welcome to Deep Impact, a proud member of the Doof Network, where we dive deep into Wildbo's most diabolical work five years on. Coming up next is Elliot Diebold. And that was Ruben Morehouse. And we are back to talk about Arc 5, Conviction. Um, yes. The first, the first chapter of Arc 5 starts pretty much exactly where the last Blake chapter ended. Blake is in the forest, standing over a dead body, surrounded by a number of police officers uh, <laughs> in a variety of different uniforms and roles. Uh, yeah. Uh-oh. Um... Yeah. There's, there's not really much to say here. This whole section and, and maybe even this whole chapter just really has a vibe of shit. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. Like Blake is just sort of constantly listing off little ideas and then immediately dismissing them. Like there's a sense of hopelessness or he's like, maybe I, no, uh, no. <laughs> yeah. I, I think um, it, since this is the first chapter in a new arc, it doesn't want to get too depressing, but it would be quite easy for Blake to be a lot more desperate and cornered in this situation. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, I mean, I think he handles himself, you know, big picture pretty well uh, throughout this whole chapter. Mm, yeah, yeah, well, I, yeah, definitely. Especially uh, when we get to some of the stuff that happens in the interrogation room. But mm. we're skipping ahead. Uh, so Blake kind of pieces together that somebody has tipped off the police because... You know, there's, like, plain clothes officers. There's a, you know, like, a, a more senior officer. There's, like, lab tech people. Um, so it definitely smells like a setup. Yeah, the fact that there's what seem to be, like, forensics people uh, present really tells you that this is no accident. Um, they yeah. were They came prepared. Yes, although there's a part... There is a part where one of the police officers says, like, oh, shit, the body's here or something, right? Which makes me think... I don't know. It makes me think either that guy's not used to seeing bodies or <laughs> or um, they were tipped off about following Blake rather than here's the location of the body. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's a little unclear to me as well. But the point is, it's definitely there's something going on. This wasn't this wasn't a coincidence or a, or oh, yeah. just just a karma <laughs> uh, fuck over. Um, the police weren't just, you know, by coincidence, taking the whole squad out in uniform to a specific <laughs> spot. <laughs> Um, uh, there's also there's a little bit where the police you know as they start to to chain him up they mention you know he ha- he'll have access to free counsel or he can yeah. call a lawyer and it's addressed <laughs> more concretely later but there's no way that somebody reads this bit and, and doesn't sort of go well yeah okay I guess that's an option like he might have to do that like I think it's I think it's very intentional that Wilbur sort of puts that seed of the lawyers as an out right at the start here um because it really contextualizes Blake not using them for the rest of the chapter. Mm. Yeah, 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 it's true. I don't know. I, it's interesting to me because definitely if I was in Blake's shoes, I know what the price is for calling the lawyers to bail me out, right? Like, we already mm. know the price for the next favor, um, or Blake already knows, we don't quite know. Um, assuming that it's not horrible, I would. this is the situation where I would have called the lawyers, right? Yeah, um, but, that, but that's, like, and Blake calls us as well, but that's the whole fucking thing with these lawyers, is, like, they yeah. it, it, uh, they know, and so it's like they're, they're just trying to trick him into something, and, and you're trying not to fall for it, but yeah. it's, like, exactly what uh, 4.x was talking about, Ooh. this would be the easy thing to do, is just... Uh, do whatever the lawyers need you to do, and it's probably going to seem harmless, but it's probably not going to be. Uh, yeah. It's true. Um, the other thing is, you know, if I were Blake, I would have called the lawyers back when Conquest first tried to chain me up, to yeah. be honest. Um, yeah, I, so, I probably would have too. I probably would have been like, hey, can you guys get me the fuck out of this whole uh, Conquest? Let's thing? not deal with this situation. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, I think... There may be a bit of sunken cost fallacy going on here for Blake. <laughs> like he hasn't called them yet. All right, I, if I can get if I can get out of the conquest shit, I can get out of this shit. Yeah, but it all comes to like it. It, it perfectly relates to what Four Point X was talking about with the whole taking the easy way out. That's expressly oh, yeah, what totally. not what Blake is doing here. And I, it, you know, that's obviously very intentional. We've just had a chapter that talks about how the reason Diablos get fucked up is because they keep taking the easy way out and then we have a chapter where blake is expressly not doing that yeah i mean yeah he's he's doing what the book that he read that was also given to him by the lawyers so i don't know if he's avoiding playing into their hand or playing into their hand Um, well yeah yeah exactly uh like maybe they want him to get himself further and further into trouble so he's even more desperate when he has to call on them yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Um, anyway, so, you know, the police officers start taking him away, boys, and kind of discussing the 
the possibilities of what he's done, obviously being found over a, the dead body of a child, is is not great. Um, yeah. And obviously Evan is tethered to his body, so Evan just kind of watches him leave. Yeah, it's pretty heartbreaking um, way as Evan sort of just tries to follow along and, you know, thinking at it from Evan's perspective, he's just been lost, scared, and hunted for, for months. Yeah. Uh, and now he's just made a friend and the friend's being taken away and you can sort of feel this desperation of he's just like trying to follow because he doesn't want to be left alone. And Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and the same thing from Blake's perspective, honestly. Like, he, he's finally yeah. found some <laughs> a, 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 an ally, someone that he likes enough to want to make his familiar and right at the, right at the cusp of that happening, oh, no, nope, see ya. Yeah, actually, I don't know why exactly, but reading that in our notes has just made me realize, even if Rose wakes up, she's still, like, chained up to Conquest. So, like, for all we know, she's awake already and just Mm. doesn't really have the ability to come and, like, update Blake. Uh, Like, you know, because she was able to before, but that was before Conquest had sort of lured her in, and there's no guarantee that when she wakes up, he'll give her back. Mm. It's true. I, I, I don't know... I do think that while he is kind of dicking Blake over, he's he's not, you know, denying him resources to that extent yet, right? Yeah, yeah, probably not. Um, um, but you're right, there's it- really no guarantee that Rose isn't already back conscious again and just <laughs> <laughs> Conquest is doing whatever the hell he would do. Yeah, um, and then obviously there's this bit where Blake gets frisked by the police, which makes him a little bit uncomfortable and I think is, you know, sort of getting us in the mindset for what happens in the interrogation room. Yeah. Um, but they take his, like, locket with the hair and they open mm-hmm. it and it may have fallen out and it's like, they took his stash, man. Yeah, maybe he finally will <laughs> be not reliant on glamour, you know. He'll have to go cold turkey. Yeah, because well, it has sort of been his his trick of choice and uh, mm-hmm. from, a, from a sort of meta story perspective, may- maybe it is time that he is forced to expand his toolbox to rely it on was, it, 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 it was it was too versatile the the glamour like, it was almost he, he was too yeah. good at it yeah he, he actually did take to it quite well didn't he um yeah so blake is taken to an interrogation room and is uh clearly being needled to be uncomfortable um and the rest of this chapter is is an interrogation yeah and and the whole bit opens with him sort of briefly stating, oh, I've been, like, booked and, and fingerprinted and I'm in the system, all that sort of stuff. Yep. And then he specifies that his free legal counsel is on the way. And I think that's yep. really important because that immediately, again, establishes that he's not calling the lawyers. So yes. we've had that. Yeah. We've had the idea of the lawyers seated into us and then we've also had it seated into us that Blake is, at the moment, not doing he's that. He's not going for it, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, from there we have, like, all these paragraphs about how the room is, like, designed to make Blake uncomfortable. Uh, yeah. and, like, even, even with him, like, being aware of that, that doesn't really stop it from working. Uh, com- <laughs> yeah. Not completely, I, anyway. I mean, these techniques exist as interrogation room techniques because they work on most people, right? Like, they make you uncomfortable. Um. Yeah, well, and a- the thing about psychology is just, just knowing doesn't necessarily make it super easy to fix a problem, right? Like, like yeah. knowing you have a phobia doesn't mean that you're just over the yeah. phobia, and it's the same with you these sorts of things. think your way out of it, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's also a great line where, you know, there, there's, like, the mirror in the interrogation room, which is obviously, like, one of those one-way mirrors, mm-hmm. and uh, Blake says that he looked to confirm uh, whether people are on the other side, and looked is italicized, uh, and I yeah. just like that as a little way of emphasizing, like immediately as a reader, I was like, oh, he, like, oh, he, he the site. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's cool, isn't it? And, and it's like, I looked to confirm and yes, there were people behind this wall and you're like, oh, oh yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think this is such a fun setup for a chapter because, you know, an interrogation room is, is the perfect place to test his, Blake's ability to, uh, lie in air quotes to, 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 massage the truth you know um it's a really fun Mm. practitioner setup to be in i think it's cool yeah well and it's it's especially good for blake because it's a small cramped one which plays to his his other issues as well so specifically designed for blake uh and and yeah you're right like interrogating practitioners is well i mean this is what blake wanted to do with the Baham children back in like arc two right is (laughs) He's put them in this exact situation. Uh, yeah, this is karma coming back to bite him. <laughs> um, 
but not not that kind of karma. The, the, <laughs> well, it could the, be, I mean, that the kind colloquial of karma too, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah so that's a good point. Um, um, so, um, <laughs> so uh, Blake gets starts getting interrogated. There are two interrogators. There's a younger man named Dunk and an older man whose name we don't learn. Um, and they mm. they both kind of start needling Blake, basically just fucking with him to try and get some kind of reaction out of him and, and open that up into a, a, a breach in his defences and then kind of, you know, finding out stuff through that. Yeah, well, because he's in that situation where his, his lawyer isn't there, so he's not obligated to speak, but they're doing everything they can to pressure him into slipping and, and saying something stupid. And again, like, he's aware of that's what's happening, and he does a pretty good job of not taking the bait but he does kind of start to take it towards the end I, I don't think he says anything too bad but he uh he doesn't he doesn't just sit there silently like he probably should have yeah well yeah he he actually yeah he does pretty good right like yeah he does basically as well as you could expect him to he he makes a little mistake where he reacts poorly when they touch him but he, he does mostly quite well but just this situation is so <laughs> is so stacked against him. Like, not to mention the magical shenanigans going on, but Blake is just like, there's no explanation for the situation that Blake was caught in. Yeah, yeah. Like, even if Duncan wasn't there, like, uh, Blake would be pretty pretty screwed. Yeah, uh, and he, all they really have all to, they he... have to do all they have to do is hold him for a day, which is like within the legal right, and you know something that they would probably do in this situation anyway. Hmm. Uh, and so I wanted to call out this bit where, so the police officers use like a slur to try and get a rise out of Blake uh, and, and he's sort of thinking about why they've done this and then he's sort of, because they're wanting him to defend his sexuality or, yeah. or you know, that, that's sort of what they're targeting and he yeah. describes him, he describes himself as, quote, uh, not exactly practicing straight, <laughs> um, which is like a neat sort of idea in and of itself. Like Blake's sort of issues with physical contact and stuff. Uh, I mean, he's not really interested in sex, and so yeah. there's sort of some something there where he's he doesn't consider himself practicing straight. But I also think the word practicing uh, is a very uh, deliberate word uh, in the story <laughs> because obviously uh, it, he's also I, I think partially blaming it on the fact that he's too busy with other practices, uh, so mm. to speak. Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, it doesn't. It probably doesn't leave much time for those kinds of things in your life when you are fighting for your life. Basically, eighty percent of the time you're awake. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I want to. I want to get back to this. Uh, this misstep that Blake makes. He he kind of uh, has a little instinctive reaction where he, uh, I think, kind of flinches when when uh, Dunk touches his leg, mm. and the two interrogators immediately latch on to this realizing oh you know he he has he doesn't like it when you get up in his grill and so obviously the rest of the interrogation is them fucking with his space as much as they can <laughs> Wait, what what a dick move it uh, is isn't is, it it's, Man. it's like oh because like later on it's it's basically they're like oh he seems to have some sort of ptsd let's yeah. And then they, they effectively just that. take advantage yeah. of it. Yeah. <laughs> Which is it's just Fuck. <laughs> right, yeah, pretty horrible. Um it, as I was going through here, there were like five or ten wait, wait, five to ten parts of of this sort of interrogation that I specifically wanted to pull out, uh, because they were like really well written or, or clever and I've just yeah. had to pull none of them to save time, uh, otherwise we'll be here all day. Yeah. Uh so I'm just going to say this whole bit is really intense and deserves yeah. recognition. Uh, it, it's great. Um, it's good, isn't it? Uh, yeah. I, I, I love the, these. The characters of the cops are so interesting to me because they are they are uh, abusing, using somewhere on that scale, using the fact that he has PTSD and space issues to try and get him to confess more. And it's like, mm. it's, I don't know, from their perspective, I wonder how they're justifying that. Like, is it, oh, this guy killed a kid, let's you it, like he's he's scum but but then yeah. duncan knows that he didn't do that but i guess he thinks he's a diabolist which is yeah duncan the same thing in his mind <laughs> well yeah duncan's like he's a diabolist who gives a fuck how he feels uh, yeah. is probably what he's thinking uh, it is i don't know i i don't know i don't know how morally defensible their actions are here yeah i i would agree uh it, it doesn't sit it doesn't sit well with me at all um mm. There's probably one line I want to pull out because uh, it stood out to me a little bit on the first go and then we, we find out a bit more about Duncan and so on the second read through, it's even more uh, sort of important, I think, which yeah. is uh, Dun Duncan says to Blake, uh, tell me, 
even make something up so long as you make it convincing enough to satisfy my curiosity. And yeah. so this is interesting because, like, if Blake lies, but it's because he was told to make something up, is that bad karma? Like, I is this this is either bait or Duncan sort of handing him an opportunity. So because Duncan said it, I'm I'm leaning towards maybe it still counts even if he's told to make something up. Uh, yeah, yeah. But it, it's-, it's an interesting if a if a practitioner is told to lie, can they? Uh, I, I guess is what this brought up in my head. Mm. I don't know. I don't. I. I think lying in this situation is very dangerous because you become forsworn when someone catches you in a lie, right? And that's basically the whole point of an interrogation. <laughs> yeah, but if you're told make something up, doesn't yeah. that kind of give you the okay? I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe. I don't know. Um, now, here's a quote I wanted to pull out, which I think <laughs> is hilarious. Um, Blake is thinking about the things that make him believe there's inherent good in humanity. And he thinks of the knights of Maggie, of Paige, of Joel, Alexis, Tiffany, and my other friends. Hell, of Evan, that tenacious little boy who'd held out as long as he had. Um, he He's reaffirming his belief in the inherent good of humanity. And Rose's name is just not on this list. <laughs> it, like, I know that we joke about Blake being <laughs> shitty to Rose sometimes, but this is, like, really bad. He thinks of everybody important in his life, and he even thinks of the knights... He thinks of Maggie, someone who he, you know, who killed his cousin, and he still kind of hates. But no, no, Rose, Rose doesn't get a mention. That's so fucked up. Yeah. Well, he said humanity, not vestigity. Now, um. I, I, in what way do you think Rose is less human than Evan? Like- <laughs> yeah. Well, Evan has like a full fledged soul. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not yeah, genuinely sure. arguing this. Just, just to play devil's advocate. Uh, mm. I, I know I'm on, I'm on your side. Leaving Rose out of this seems either harsh or neglectful. Um, well, yeah. Is it just like out of sight, out of mind? Like, I don't even. I know. mean, that's. That's the charitable reading that's still not very good. Like, <laughs> it's, it's not very charitable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I love but, that Maggie gets a mention and Rose doesn't. It's so, it's so bizarre. Yeah, his opinion of Maggie definitely seems to have softened in the last arc in a bit. Yeah. Uh, I guess her attribute of not actively trying to kill him has uh, yeah. has sort of proven even more rare and thus even more valuable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, I just thought I I just think that's hilarious that Rose is yeah, completely it's... skipped. Well, um, so yeah. uh, eventually Blake's lawyer arises, uh, arrives, and and the officers, excluding Dunk, head out to meet her, and and Duncan stays and does a little rune to give them some privacy, and reveals that he is Duncan Behaim, Laird's nephew, um, and they have a little bit of a chat on the level of practitioner, a practitioner. Yeah, just in case you hadn't yet. Decided that this was already led <laughs> fucking with Blake. Uh, yeah. we, we it turns out this is all being led by his nephew. Just in case the uh, the smugness of Duncan hasn't indicated <laughs> that he's related to Led. Um, yeah. So so Duncan basically explains to Blake what what what's going on. Uh, they Dunk knows all he has to do is keep Blake here for twenty four hours. Um, but while while he's here, they're going to cripple him. Is the word that Duncan uses? I think uh, mess with his friends, make his friends not trust him, make him lose his house, fuck up his life so that he doesn't he he so that the things he can do are limited and the damage that he can do is limited. Yeah. Um. And, and so he basically confirms that like he's aware of the whole conquest situation. Yeah. And and that's like so he's fine with the whole twenty four hours making Blake forsworn and and getting yeah. conquest angry at him. That's all effectively part of his plan. Like whereas Blake is sort of like, hey, you don't know what's going on. He's like, no, I do. I'm okay with that. Uh, yeah, totally. Um, oh, it's rough. Um, yeah, and, and uh, there's an interesting bit where Blake sort of calls him out and is like, this doesn't really seem like you're you're talking about bending or breaking r- the rules of like being a policeman. Like, doesn't that sort of go against whatever oath or vow you probably took when you, when yeah. you swore into service? Yeah. Uh, and Duncan basically justifies this by saying, well, you know, like, I'm breaking those rules to really uphold my vow. Like, if I, you know, if I break the rules to stop a diabolist, then as far as I'm concerned, I have upheld my vow to, like, protect the people. Yeah. <sighs> I don't know. It, <laughs> I mean, I can kind of see that perspective a bit, but I, this is, like really touching on some themes of, like, abusive police power and stuff that's hitting a bit too yeah. close, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I I think the points... We kind of discussed these points 
a fair amount last chapter in 4.x, but it is just like people hate diabolists and it's fucked up. Like, like, as it, yeah. like yeah. Uh, anyway, anyway. So here's a quote that really highlights to me how cold Duncan is, where he says, A friendless, homeless diabolist is easier to keep track of. If we dismantle you, then your actions reach only so far. So they're basically talking about ruining his life for a little peace of mind, you know, like, it's brutal. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's it's pretty rough. Yeah, I want to call out one other line, which I liked as just a little ominous line, where Blake's basically asking, <laughs> oh, how did you, how do you know so much about this? And Dunk replies, simple, he said, I asked, Blake thinks, asked? Asked who? I didn't imagine he'd tell me. <laughs> who knows what, who knows what that means? <laughs> yeah, uh- this is definitely one of those lines that's, you know, you, in an arc, I'm going to be like, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, um, and so, especially, you know, it's this is the sort of thing you put in chapter one of a of a new arc. Uh, it's, yeah, totally. It's, it's totally going to tie into whatever's going to be happening this arc. Um, so Duncan breaks the rune that was in his coffee and the lawyer and the other officers kind of find their way back in. Um, <laughs> the lawyer sits down with Blake and tries to undecide, understand his side of the story, which he can't really tell her he he tells her that he thinks he's being framed and that's basically all he can say about it yeah and so one thing that sort of jumped out to me here is as duncan leaves he refers to blake as diabolist and so using some advanced control f uh technology i actually figured out duncan never refers to him as blake and and, and neither do any of the other police officers and they never use his name and they they obviously would know his name Mm. so they, they signed him in and stuff yeah, so I, I imagine that's part of the the whole interrogation bit. Is interesting. You know, uh, they they never use his name. Do you think that's for to like to mess with him or to stop them from humanizing him? Probably both. Uh, Fair. Like it's definitely because they they only ever refer to him as like diabolist or yeah. well, Duncan refers to him as diabolist. Uh, yeah. and and so it's clearly sort of yeah dehumanizing. Yeah. Um. So. Th- the, the lawyer is, is very open with him that, that this is above her pay grade. Um, and we get back to the beat of her saying, Blake, hire a more experienced lawyer. And Blake says, no, you know, I can't afford it. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, she basically walks in. And first of all, Blake kind of roasts her in his internal thoughts. Like he's kind he of wouldn't be a wild boat protagonist if he didn't roast people who were here to help him. <laughs> uh, yeah, so he has some, like, he, he kind of, yeah destroys her appearance in his head and she basically then walks in and and sits down and is like i cannot handle this case at all like i'll I'll do my best but it's really in your interest to go above my head uh so (laughs) yeah she's 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 not really set up to be a huge asset uh or ally on on team blake yeah yeah Uh, and you know this this leads blake to say this he says i don't really have the option the only lawyers i could pay would be ones i really don't want to be in debt to and uh yeah i mean (laughs) yeah we we kind (laughs) of talked about this before if i were in Blake's shoes i would go for it but you know um yeah and and i mean i think he gets he gets a little smile from duncan when he says (laughs) this as well so it's kind of like the one The one thing Duncan was probably worried about here uh, was Blake using the lawyers, and yeah. Blake has just basically confirmed that that's not happening. So it's uh, yeah, 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 definitely. Um, so, <laughs> so you know, the officers come back in, and the lawyer and uh, kind of is is talking to them, revealing what Blake has told her that Laird is at the center of a conspiracy to fra- to frame Blake, um, and and this kind of gets Duncan removed from play. Yeah, small victories. Uh, yeah, v- no, very good, small victories. <laughs> small, indeed, very small victories. Um, it, it is, it is something though. It is a a, a a a point that Blake has scored, right? More or less. Um, Duncan yeah, well, doesn't I mean, seem too upset by it though. He just kind of rolls his eyes. Yeah, we see at the end of the chapter that he was still like around, so it clearly hasn't hampered him that much. It's maybe yeah. made his life. A little bit more difficult. Yes. Uh, so one of the ways it makes his life more difficult is Duncan has to leave. But before he leaves, he gives the other investigator basically a tip. Um, get him to ask about Blake's interactions with, in air quotes, fictional creatures. Uh, the, the officers now suspect Blake is schizophrenic and ask him about, does he talk to aliens? Does he talk to ghosts? Did he talk to <laughs> Evan before that night? And Blake kind of has to dig himself deeper. <laughs> yeah, it's a brilliant... It, yeah, it's a pretty brilliant 
uh, Masterstroke by Duncan. I, I got to admit, like uh, yeah. forcing it to be yes or no answers as well uh, really plays into the the hands of the interrogators. Uh, and an opening with aliens, <laughs> and then moving on to goblins kind of makes it look like Duncan didn't know anything. Like yeah. you, you know, he 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 plays it really well. He doesn't just go straight for it. He he kind of misses intentionally so as to yeah. uh, as to not like make it too obvious. Yeah. Uh, the the other officers refer to Duncan as their best investigator at points and it it, it really just does feel like he kind of cheats the system in situations like this. Yeah, I uh, yeah, he's their best investigator because he's probably enhancing his skills. Yeah. Um yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is a great move by Duncan, right? Like, Blake looks genuinely mentally ill. Yeah, there's a bit where they're sort of like, do you see ghosts, goblins, grumpkins, or anything in that <laughs> vein? And all Blake can come up with to respond is, I'm open-minded to possibilities, which yeah. is such a shit answer to that question. Yeah. It earns him pitying looks by basically everyone in the room. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. His law- even his lawyers just say, oh, this, this poor kid's just not. Yeah. Um, so eventually the questioning is over. Uh, Blake possibly has changed his fate from jail to a mental asylum, uh, and he is taken to a cell, and on the way to his cell sees Evan, who is here now. Yeah, and there's a, I believe it's a new cop named Max, who actually sort of treats Blake like a human, like he he realises Blake's sensitive to touch, and he's like, hey, I'm not going to touch mm. you as long as you cooperate, which yeah. seems like the sensible way to handle that situation. So Yeah, uh, you- Thank yeah, God there's, Max- a, there's at least one reasonable policeman here. <laughs> yeah, Max deserves a shout out just for not being a massive arsehole. Yeah. Um, so Evan's Evan's body has been taken somewhere nearby, presumably a morgue in the station, um, and his yeah. spirit has come along with it. And uh, yeah, the old team's back together. Evan and Blake fre- together forever. Rose who? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, and this also seems to be the first thing that sort of genuinely catches Duncan off guard. Like, he yeah. sort of raises his eyebrows, and it's not clear whether that's, like, an interested raising his eyebrows or, like, a uh, uh-oh type raising his eyebrows, but it's it's probably the first thing that has caught him off guard, uh, so that's a good yeah. sign. Yeah. Um, yeah, and there's a line here where Blake is considering his options, and he thinks, I'd need some more help than just Evan if I was going to get out of this and seize that slim chance. And that presumably means that he feels like he needs Rose. <laughs> <laughs> which well, about time yeah i guess i actually uh, again i use those uh powerful control f skills that i have uh after this to figure out that the the word rose is not used in this chapter once <laughs> um so this is this is as close as you get, as you can get but I, I don't know if he is specifically thinking of rose i feel like if he was he might have said it he just he is kind of just saying he needs more um <laughs> it, it, it did get me wondering though like so presumably, like I think one of the one of the big things about having a familiar is you get to leech some power off of them. Yeah. And so hopefully Blake could use that to funnel the connection to Rose to help her come back quicker if she if she hasn't already, depending on what Pose's radiation is still doing. Yeah. Um, which just using Evan to get Rose back would be the worst because then when Rose is outraged that Blake has signed up for a familiar without her, he's going to get to be all like, well. Yeah, but I needed him to get you back. You know, <laughs> he's the only, he's the only reason you're here. Like that makes it 100 yeah. percent okay. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I, hope, <sighs> I, I hope I don't have to watch Blake make that argument to her because it's gonna it's gonna enrage me. Mm, we'll, we'll see. Uh, there's another point where he thinks about calling the lawyers. Um, he's been thinking about it, obviously throughout the chapter and kind of denying it. And uh, he yeah. thinks here the natural answer was I'd need to do something wrong to get out of this. Fuck that. With all sincerity, fuck that idea backwards and forwards. I was not going down that road. Um, Blake mm. says this with such conviction that, it, you know, it, I, I reckon this is going to be a theme, this arc. Like, how much is Blake going to slip down that path? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as we've al- already sort of touched on earlier, it really ties into what 4.x was talking about. Uh, you know, we're seeing Blake reject that easy path, mm. and it's it's going to be a matter of can he maintain that conviction? Uh Will he be able to avoid taking the easy path as things presumably get trickier and, and worse? Yeah, yeah, um, and we will have to see. So uh, that's the end of, of Conviction 5.1. A nice setup chapter that gives us an interesting little uh, puzzle box to play in here with Blake avoiding his uh, his, his arrest. <laughs> <clears throat> 
Um, so we decided we wanted to dive into some comments and see what people were thinking on this day five years ago when the chapter first came out. Uh, I, I put out a comment first by uh, Sir Fuente, uh, and this comment is is theorizing that uh, it's in response to a comment about how Blake always seems to just have these very close near misses to a bunch of, of situations. Um, and Sir Fuente theorizes or, or points out a theory that he has that Blake has had another companion throughout this story that has allowed him to have so many near scrapes. Somebody who is, you know, helping out but is going to be eaten by the erasure demon. And we're experiencing the kind of amended memory version of what has been happening in these situations. Um yeah. I like this theory. It it, it doesn't <laughs> Sir Fuente admits it doesn't really have much evidence beyond the fact that like <laughs> it would be cool and therefore it's gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well I mean uh, uh, by definition if there was evidence of it then the theory would kind of fold in on itself. Um Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's definitely I mean, <laughs> as you've sort of pointed out in your notes here, does Rose not count as a companion who's helped him out of these new, <laughs> yeah, I don't <laughs> these know. new death experiences? Yeah. I mean, the, Rose has been that companion a lot, but uh, still some near scrapes recently that yeah. Rose hasn't been around for. Yeah, has there been somebody else helping him out in Toronto that uh, mm. is going to get erased and thus we don't know about? Yeah, yeah. Um, I just thought that's an interesting little theory to think about. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I do think it it, it would be kind of cool and it does, it does kind of feel to me like the sort of thing Wobbo would do but again it with the erasure demon stuff i don't know how he'd how we'd ever know like this would have to be something that would never get a hard confirmation uh yeah. but it reminds me a little bit of uh imp's introduction in worm uh, yeah. as a concept uh yeah true so so you know and that's sort of that's both evidence for and against the idea i guess because if it's that similar to imp's stuff wobbo might not want to repeat himself but also yeah he does do stuff like this, uh, so yeah, like know. format breaking stuff. Um, there's there's a notable one that has literally just happened in Ward, like one or two chapters ago, um, and it's a fun thing to do. So we'll see if uh, if it if it comes up here. Yeah, uh, and so for my comment, after wading through probably a hundred comments that were just are all Bahames this smug. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, we uh, made I've... some of those comments ourselves, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, it does seem to be a, a family trait. Uh, I found a comment by a user named Snoof, uh, and Snoof just points out uh, that Duncan mentioned they were turning Blake's apartment upside down, uh, which presumably contains that note he wrote in 4.9, which is yeah. probably fairly incriminating. This so, is a great observation, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. Just a neat little observation of something that may come to the fore in the next couple of chapters. Yeah, either they're going to have some pretty compelling evidence that he's genuinely crazy, or, I don't know, <laughs> something else has happened, someone else has, like, taken the note, who knows what could have happened. Making the case that he's crazy is going to be so easy if that's the route they want to take. <laughs> yeah, like, he's describing <laughs> siblings that he doesn't have, and, like, dealings with demons. I mean, there's probably some incriminating stuff in there about Laird, so... Possibly that will be an avenue for like Laird to actually want to, you know, sweep it under the rug. I don't know. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, some good comments. I really enjoy hearing what what people are thinking, where people, uh, what people's heads are at five years ago. Um, mm. We'll see how these things come to fruition as we continue through uh, conviction over the next few episodes. Um, yeah, but, but apart from that's, that, that's that, that <laughs> yeah, ends that's our the episode. End of the chapter for today, though. Um, so if you uh, if you enjoyed the show and you want to discuss some of these crazy wacky theories with us, the place to do that is in the discussion thread, which will be linked in the uh, episode description for this episode. Yes, and if you want to subscribe to our show or any of the other great shows on the Doof Network, uh, like we've got Ward, which is uh, just starting Arc Thirteen now, uh, and mm. Arc Thirteen is awesome. So you can check that out at <laughs> doofmedia.com. Yes, um, and to support the network, you can go to the uh, the Doof Media Patreon, which is patreon.com slash doofmedia. Um, Doof Media is a network that exists because of its patrons. Uh, this is a show that is now on the network just because Doof Media has patrons. And um, there's more Patreon-exclusive stuff that will be coming up soon, so uh, pay attention to the Patreon, and if you feel like uh, giving us some money or upping your money donation, it would be really helpful. It generally helps us keep doing this show. Yeah, totally. Um... And if, you know, if you've heard of Wild Bow, well, I guess if you haven't, you probably haven't been listening to, to this yep. podcast very carefully. paying attention. <laughs> um, <laughs> Wild Bo also has a Patreon, uh, which is patreon.com slash Wild And obviously he, he does this full time. So he relies on, on people's generosity to keep writing these stories. And the stories are really good. So, uh, 
you know, please, please send some money you can spare his way. Yeah, not just that, though. I mean, something that I've really appreciated as we've become more active in the community is just how much Wabo, like, nurtures the community for this stuff and cares about the people who who care about these stories, right? Like, it's genuinely very heartwarming to have this author who writes these things that people enjoy and and vocally enjoy and have him be able to engage with them on a level. Um, yeah, it, it just, it's a really nice community, and that community exists because of Wabo, so... Make sure you 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 know give him some money because that's what allows all this to happen. Yeah, you know, it's there's not many places where you have the the author or the creator uh, as a as a presence in like the subreddit or something. Yeah, so it's it's really cool to see. Yeah, yeah, Duncan on memes answering both to <laughs> to questions, all that stuff. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so uh, also, if you want to engage with us, we have a Twitter which is at MediaMD Podcast on Twitter, um, and you can tweet us there, and we'll you know probably respond to you there. Or uh, you can see when our episodes are coming out, all that cool stuff. Um, Speaking of when our episodes are coming out, our next episode, Conviction 5.2, will be out on Friday the 12th of April. So we'll see you then. See ya. See ya.